Hello and welcome to Caregivers First, the show brought to you by SCAN, the Social Communities Activities Network, the nonprofit agency dedicated to helping active adults stay informed, empowered, and inspired. My name is Lavelle Jones, and I'm the host of Caregivers First. I'm so excited about today's show, so let's get right into it. Sometimes caregivers face the situation of a loved one who has trouble keeping a checkbook or perhaps is confused about money. The caregiver may need to consider stepping in. The topic of today's show is managing a loved one's money. To help us navigate this broad subject, we are so fortunate to have as our guest, Mr. Gary Garland. Gary, welcome to the show. Lavelle, thank you so much. It's a pleasure for us to have you with us today. As I mentioned at the start, the subject of managing a loved one's money is very broad. So as you suggested for today's conversation, we're going to focus on two things. That is legally managing a loved one's money and financially managing a loved one's money. So I'd like to start with the basics if we could. What legal authority does one need to manage a loved one's money and who can give that authority? Sure. Uh, let's start with part two. The principal is the person who can give that authority. Uh, if I want you to manage my money, I can ask you to do it, and you can then do it or not as you choose. But in order to be able to do it, I first wanted to give you authority, and then I have to give you legal authority to do so. Okay. I can add you onto my bank account as a joint owner, which may not be the best idea. I can go to the bank with you and fill out a signature card and have you fill out a signature card and then you're on the account, or I can execute something like a power of attorney. So there are different ways for the principal, the person with the authority, to let someone else act on their behalf. Okay. You mentioned um, that one of the things might be uh, uh, to set up a joint checking account. There, I kind of indicated there are pros and cons to that. Sure. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, one of the questions is, does the person who um, is asking for or needs assistance intending to have the other person, you, uh, become the owner on that account if something happens to them or even the owner on the account while they're still alive and okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's where joint ownership may not be the best of idea. Uh, I know some people call them convenience accounts where someone's name is put on an account, a nephew, a loved one, in order to help manage the account and when that person passes away, it then becomes that other person's account, uh, which may or may not have been the intent. Oh, I see, okay. Um, as a principal, um, can anyone uh, give someone else authority uh, regardless of their, uh, I'll say regardless of their mental state? And, and by that sure. I'm thinking of, well, uh, what if I'm somewhat incapacitated if I, you know, if I have uh, dementia or or something like that, am I able to um, give someone else the authority to manage my money? Um, it's a definite maybe. So uh, we have clients come into the office and they tell me they have a diagnosis of dementia or even Alzheimer's. They're aware of it. So for legal capacity, we need somebody to be lucid at the moment of execution of a legal document. So uh, we deal with families where at the moment they may understand what they're doing and an hour later they may forget that they have done so. Mm -hmm. And that will generally be considered legal authority as long as you're executing legal documents or the permissions while they're aware of what they're doing. I see, okay. All right, thank you for that. That's a sure. very important point. Um, you mentioned power of attorney. Tell us, tell us about that, what, what is that? Sure, um, this is often misunderstood and for our purposes there's two different types. A healthcare power of attorney to allow an agent uh, to make medical decisions on your behalf if you're unable to do so. For managing the money, we're interested in the financial power of attorney, which again grants permission to the person to act on your behalf. There's two main points I'd like to talk about. Durable, which means it survives the person's incapacity, or non-durable, which means if I'm incapacitated, it no longer works. We generally want durable. We do, okay. Okay, and why is that? Because if I need a power of attorney for when I'm disabled and it's non-durable, it won't work anymore. So we can have a very limited power of attorney, like my real estate attorney can sign documents for me at my house closing. But that doesn't help me very much if I'm in a car accident and then something needs to be done with my bank account or my IRA. Mm -hmm. So if I'm disabled, 
I will want my agent to be able to act on my behalf while I am disabled. Mm -hmm. I want it to survive in capacity. I see. Okay. Thank you for, for that. Sure. Um, there's a term that uh, we often hear, but I hear it used more for younger people, and that is setting up a trust. Um, is a trust something that is may also be beneficial um, when we're talking about caregiving and perhaps taking control of someone else's accounts? It, it can be, and um, there's about 65 different types of trusts, and in order that, no, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> so for our purposes, there's revocable or revocable okay. and irrevocable. And uh, at one point I had a website, trustmeister.com. I thought it was funny. But uh, a trust, uh, in my office we have little buckets, and a trust is a bucket, and it can hold stocks, bonds, real estate, or cash. And the idea is we put things into the trust, into this bucket, and we decide who will be in charge of the bucket. That person or people are called the trustee or trustees, and that can be a revocable or irrevocable, as I mentioned. And they have different effects, and it depends what you're looking to do. If I have one checking account, and my Social Security is $2,000 a month, and my balance is $3,000, I probably won't set up a trust for somebody to handle that. A power of attorney or a signature card can probably get the job done. But if I have a house and if I have uh, brokerage accounts and other assets, there can be tax advantages to a trust and also disadvantages, and there can also be safety involved with the trust. Mm -hmm. So we use trusts quite often. It's just not a be-all, end-all solution for everybody. Okay, and y you said that there may also be safety considerations. What do you mean by that? with the trust? Uh, well, with the trust, um, if I have my son-in-law as the trustee, mm -hmm. that could be fine, but he could also pull money out of it, uh, whether I want him to or not. Mm -hmm. uh, if he divorces my daughter, then what happens? I have no sons-in-law. But, uh, <laughs> you know, so there are those things that can occur. If I put you on my account as a joint account holder with me, mm -hmm. you could run away with the money. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, what if you're in a car accident and they sue you and get a judgment against my own account? A trust can help avoid that. It can help insulate against the trustee's problems. I see. Okay, that's an important point. Okay, thank you. We're talking about managing other people's money. So uh, there, there must be some obligations and, and rules that people who manage other people's money have to follow. Um, can you talk to us a bit about that? That would be my pleasure. And um, that's a fiduciary obligation. It's a, what is it again? Fiduciary. Okay. And as long as you don't ask me to spell it, we'll be fine. Okay, I won't. Uh, but uh, for good luck, it starts with an F. And a fiduciary is somebody with a legal obligation to act in the best interest of another. So if as an attorney, I'm automatically a fiduciary. As a certified financial planner, I'm automatically a fiduciary. But what does that mean? I have to do what's best for the person I'm acting for as opposed to something that may be beneficial for them but helps me out. So for example, uh, an insurance agent, I'm also one, but at, under a suitability guideline, an insurance agent could sell you an appropriate life insurance product maybe not the best one for you, but one that's appropriate, and then they get a better trip. That's not a fiduciary. A fiduciary says, if you need a life insurance product, I will sell you the best one. Doesn't matter what the commission is. It doesn't matter any of this other stuff that attributes to the person. It's what's beneficial for you. Okay. As a fiduciary, if I'm managing your money, if I'm, if I'm your friend, your neighbor, your niece, your child, and I'm on that account with you, and I'm managing your money, I can't do a good job for you and also a good job for me, I have to do a good job for you. I can't steal the money, I can't borrow the money, which I, you see sometimes, you can't do any of that stuff. I see, okay, excellent. Um, when should one consider hiring a professional to manage a loved one's money? Well, since you're speaking to a professional, I would say as soon as possible, as soon as they see this broadcast. But the reality is, um, if, you're able to tell that things are getting a little more blurry. If you're getting a little more confused, maybe that's when you need some help. And it may not be the elder who's looking for the help. It may be the child of the elder who's looking for the mm. help. Okay, okay. And um, in your practice, just a sort of general question, when you, um, what are some of the most common reasons that, that people 
um, decide that they have to manage someone else's money? What are some of the situations that, sure. that, that we find ourselves in? Uh, it, it's probably what you would expect or you might see on TV on Hoarders or any of these other shows. Uh, you may have an elder who's living by themselves. Uh, they're uh, very often the husband dies first and the wife who has not perhaps handled the money before is letting bills slip, uh, is, is letting bills accumulate, shut off notices and so forth. So if we have a situation, uh, the food isn't being bought, the person isn't caring well for themselves, that may be a very good time for somebody to step in and help them out. Okay, I see. All right. Um, now, when, let's say I am considering managing uh, someone else's money, let's say a, a loved one, uh, that's, that's a pretty big obligation, I would think. So what are some of the things that I need to consider before I step into something like that? Sure. Uh, I, the first thing I would consider is who might the adverse parties be? So if you go to manage your loved one's money, your, your parent, your, your cousin, whoever it is, are there going to be other family members coming out of the woodwork asking for money or accusing you of stealing the money? That's part of it. Uh, do we have uh, a niece or a nephew who thinks they stand to inherit and they don't want you to spend as much money on the loved one's care because there'll be less for them later on? So again, we're looking for adverse parties. Um, once that's taken care of, I would highly recommend transparency so this way there's no question that everything has been done properly. And how would you go about making sure that everything is transparent? Do you, you know, meet with potential adverse folks or how would you do that? You can do that. Uh, if there's an accountant involved, for example, perhaps a duplicate statement goes to the person's accountant as well as to you. Uh, if they still have some capacity, then perhaps a duplicate statement goes to them. And this way they can see what the transactions have been, the bills that have been paid, and, and that nobody's enriched themselves as a result of that. Mm -hmm. is, it, um, is there any uh, advantage to um, a, a family member managing uh, someone's money as opposed to uh, a third party, um, either professional or third party non-related person? Well, going back to our first definition of managing the money, who's taking care of it, you very often see a child doing it for their parent, and I think that's great. There's no fees involved, there's no costs, uh, and, and it's just a natural thing to do. If, on the other hand, there's substantial assets and investments, then maybe leaving it all in the checking account isn't the wisest course. I see. Okay, so there, there are so many considerations that, that anyone who's considering um, providing this service for another, because I think it is a service when you're managing someone else's money, you still have to take a lot of things into consideration because it's it's a serious obligation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's so much more that I would like to talk about on this subject and we will certainly do that. We're going to take a very short break and uh, when we come back we'll pick that up. So for those of you in the audience, would you please uh, join us in a few minutes? We'll be right back to continue our discussion with Gary Garland. You probably already know that rehabilitation is a must for successful recovery from surgery, injury, or serious illness. What you may not know is that you're free to choose where you go for rehab. In Monmouth and Ocean County, the compelling choice is CARE One. Where you choose to go for rehab matters, and with CARE One, you have four convenient locations to choose from in Monmouth and Ocean Counties. CARE One at Jackson, CARE One at Wall, CARE One at Homedale, and CARE One at King James in the Atlantic Highlands. At CARE One, you'll work with a team of experts to develop a plan based on your needs and goals. You'll have the full support of caring, compassionate physicians, RNs, licensed therapists, and nutritionists dedicated to helping you recover successfully without setbacks at a pace that makes you comfortable and successful in meeting your rehabilitation goals. Once you take the first step with us, you'll never look back. Call 877-99-CARE-1 today and come for a tour. Hello and welcome back to Caregivers First. We're talking with Gary Garland about managing a loved one's money. Gary, I want to pick up where we left off before the break and 
Um, let me ask a basic question. We're talking about managing a loved one's money. What do we actually mean by that? Are we, are we talking about just you know, paying bill, uh, just writing checks and paying bills, or are we talking about something beyond that? Well, uh, based on the way you posed the question, it could be either. So if the loved one, and I alluded earlier, if they have a modest uh, bank account, a checking account, Social Security comes in, there's not a whole lot else, managing money to me would just be you're, you're paying their bills. You're, you're providing a convenience for them. You're acting as their bookkeeper. Uh, on the other hand, if they have substantial assets, they have a house, uh, they have brokerage or investments, then to me managing money is paying the bills, but also how should that money be invested and properly cared for and shepherded. Okay. Can you charge to manage a loved one's money? Yes, you can. Okay. Are there any rules around charging for managing a loved one's money? Sure. If you're operating under a power of attorney, and before we said financial power of attorney, it will usually talk about reasonable compensation. And by that, I would estimate that to be at loosely $15 an hour. If, you're, um, if you have financial licenses and you're going to actually invest and manage the money, you would get what an investment manager would charge, but then you run the risk there's a conflict of interest that you're managing your parents' money and you're charging a mm -hmm. fee on it. Mm -hmm. You run into those types of issues. Mm -hmm. But I would say for the average person helping doing the bill pay and so forth, I'd say about 15 an hour. Okay. All right, that's good information. Uh, let's uh, segue back into uh, financially managing a loved one's money. And I know that you mentioned um, investments and investing as, as part of that. So um, let's have a conversation about that. I, you shared a term with me, investment horizon. Uh, would you explain what that is and how that, that works into managing someone's money? Sure, I'd love to. But first, I'd actually like to backstep just mm -hmm. for one moment, if I may. And at the um, lowest level, I would say you walk into the assets the way you find them. So if I'm going to uh, go on my mother's checking account and I'm going to pay her bills and she has 10 shares of IBM stock, I can leave those 10 shares alone. Now the question becomes, if that was a bad choice to have left it that way, do I have liability? And there's some question about that. Mm -hmm. But I think the more reality of it is, or, or what should be more realistic is, if we have some substantial assets, are we doing them a service if we leave it all in just a CD or a, a this account or mm -hmm. a that account? Mm -hmm. As far as an investment horizon goes, what are we looking to accomplish? Um, how old is the person that we're managing the money for? How likely are we going to have enough that they don't run out of money? And then do we know who their intended beneficiaries are? So for example, if we're managing money for mom and she has three children and mom has a substantial amount of money, maybe we can figure out what she will more than, like, more than likely need for the rest of her life. We can even exaggerate that out. And then whatever's left over, we can earmark towards the intended beneficiaries. And that being the case, maybe we would invest a little more conservatively for the mom money, and then for the beneficiary money, we could be a little more aggressive. Mm -hmm. And when we're conservative, we generally will earn less money. And when we're aggressive, we can earn more money, mm -hmm. and we can also lose money. So that's something you also have to factor in. So with, with uh, the more aggressive we are, the, I, I assume the higher the risk are. Yeah. It's called the risk of reward. Okay, okay. What are some of the most common investment options? Okay, well, people have heard of the stock market, so that's a place. And if you're in the stock market, do you get stocks or do you get bonds or do you get a blend? And if we're going to get a stock, do we get one share of a company or do we get a piece of a share of a lot of companies? Mm -hmm. And when we do a piece of a share of a lot of companies, that's when we're talking about something like a mutual fund or an exchange traded mm -hmm. uh, fund, and that's, I think, far beyond what we can talk about today, but I just want to sensitize people that you can invest in stocks, which are called equities, or fixed, which is also bonds. Then there's other places to invest. You could buy a vacation property or rental property, which may be a little uh, much for some people to do if they're just walking into this. Um, you can invest in real estate in other ways, like a real estate investment trust called a REIT. Uh, you can invest in annuities, and there's many different types of annuities, and they do have their places. Um, I mean, you could invest in a racehorse, but I'd probably recommend against that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, stocks, bonds. They, they sound like they're 
probably some of the most common investment options. Yes, okay. and, and then you may walk into somebody already having stocks and bonds. Somebody worked for Procter and Gamble for 30 years, they're probably gonna have you know, Procter and Gamble mm -hmm. stock. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, do they have most of the money in, in PG stock? And then what happens if the market is shaky? Maybe they should be diversified. And part of it is, do you manipulate their investments to make them more diversified and safer or do you have the parameter where dad said for his entire life, I only want to keep it this way, and then dad's gone, and now we have mom, and mom doesn't have capacity, and do we honor dad's wishes, or do we do what's better, what, in our opinion, for mom? And those are the judgment call questions. Hard decisions, hard yes. calls, hard decisions. We've talked about actually managing the money. Um, in your experience, what are some mistakes that people have made when they've managed others' money? Sure. Uh, well, there's the son-in-law, uh, well, if you ever watched The Honeymooners, Jackie Gleason, he had all these get-rich-quick schemes, and he still drove the bus every episode. So uh, the son-in-law with the startup vaping business or CBD or, you know, hemp now, you know, if they're not careful, they're going to blow the money. Uh, they might as well put it on number seven, and maybe number seven will win, place, or show. So risky uh, schemes, those are one mistake you can make. Um, the biggest mistake that I've seen, and, and it's a breach of the fiduciary obligation, is borrowing the money. Now, if mom has 10000 in the account, and I need $1,000, and I go borrow the 1000 that's pretty bad to do, and with any luck, I'll pay it back. But if I've done that, chances are the next time I need some money, you know, it wasn't that hard to do it the first time. I need $3,000, we still have 10,000 in there, I'll borrow three and maybe I'll pay it back. And then the next time I'll forget to pay it back. Or it's just, why am I paying it back? It's nobody's looking. Mm -hmm. So that's when you can run into some real trouble. It's, it's not your money and, and you can't treat it like it's your money. I mean, that, that's the whole key. Yeah, okay, yeah, I can, I can see where that would um, be sort of intoxicating if you start using it as your own. And so that's, that's a, a, a major obligation of, of any fiduciary. It, it's not your money. You can't right. treat it like it is. Right. Stan Lee said, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. yeah. So want to be careful about that. Uh, other mistakes could be um, investing it imprudently. So do we put it all into pork bellies? You know, we're getting back to the son-in-law's get-rich-quick scheme. But at the same time, if inflation is about 2% and we keep it all in the checking account, and I've seen people with two, $300,000 in their checking account, if it's not earning any interest to speak of, and, and we have a 2% inflation rate, in a sense, we've just lost 2% every year mm -hmm. just by doing nothing. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be a balance, and I will generally advocate the bucket approach. Earlier I talked about uh, buckets for my trusts. I use the very same buckets when I illustrate um, short, medium, and long-term money. So short-term short money might be one to three years from now, uh, we need the money and we need it now, we need to be liquid. Medium-term money, maybe it's three to seven years, we can do certain things with that, and then longer term is seven to 10 years, and that could include money earmarked for grandchildren and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. So I think that's not a bad way to look at it. Okay, excellent, I, yeah, I, I can see that the way you described it, thank you. Um, I wanna talk a little bit <coughs> about um, the uh, risk of uh, elderly folks being abused um, in a in a you know uh, a situation where someone else is managing their money. What are some of the watchouts that that you can share with us to make sure that uh, you know our our loved ones are not being taken advantage of? So financial exploitation can be external, like those uh, emails, click here or send a check, uh, or they could be. Uh, more internal, like a family member stealing the money. Um, I don't remember the rest of your question. <laughs> well, what are some of the, the indications that we might see that um, someone whose money is being managed by someone else is, is being victimized? Sure. Um, if you start seeing people sniffing around them who weren't around them before, uh, the nephew starts driving up, the unemployed nephew starts driving up in the new Jaguar, well, you know, I'd, I'd question what's going on. Okay. Uh, if um, the person is being sequestered uh, and uh, not being allowed near other people, too much control over them, that would also set up a red flag. 
Okay, that, in fact, that reminds me of a point you made earlier. You were talking about transparency. So um, I, I guess a, a, a sign that maybe uh, there's some oversight needed is, is when you're not aware of what is happening with, with the loved one and their fiduciary. Yeah. Correct. If, if someone is sequestering the elder, uh, you can't find that information, um, they're being very uh, closed-lipped and you're being shut out, there might be a reason. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, in that case, uh, can anyone raise the red flag and perhaps go to the authorities? I mean, can a neighbor do that? Can, you know, just just someone who who cares about that person raise the red flag and Happens go to all the time. Happens Does all the it? time. Okay. So adult protective services, um, they will get involved if you think somebody is being financially exploited. They'll get involved if you think somebody's in an unsafe living situation. Mm -hmm. If they're not going out, if they're not clean, if they have 42 cats, uh, you know, Adult Protective Services will get involved in those instances. And that also includes abuses of powers of a th uh, attorney and um, other financial exploitation. So there, okay, so uh, d just uh, speaking about the power of attorney again, that's also a place where there can be abuses. I I've seen it where uh, one agent that we know of um, was treating it like a piggy bank, including buying a house for the elder and her family to live in. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was arrested, and okay. there's more I'm not allowed to talk about, okay. but uh, you can't abuse these things. It's a fiduciary obligation, there's yeah. a legal obligation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, you, we have to be vigilant um, when we are talking about our loved ones, particularly if, if they are elderly. We have to be vigilant and make sure that if we're not managing it, we, we know the person who is. I remember in law school the professor said the law looks out for two classes of people more than any others and those were um, the aged and pregnant women. I don't remember why, I just remember that's what they said. Okay. Well, uh, this has been um, really enlightening for me. I have learned uh, a lot that uh, I know that I and my uh, relatives uh, may find useful in the future. We have uh, just about uh, 30 seconds left. Are there any closing comments that you'd like to share and leave with our audience today? Sure. Uh, I would say uh, be alert, be vigilant. Uh, it doesn't mean don't help somebody and just be smart about how you do it. And just remember, it, it's their money, it's not your money. And I uh, appreciate uh, what you also said. Uh, consider reaching out to professionals when it's appropriate. That may be the best option. Yeah, people with licenses. People with licenses, okay, that's that's. They have something point. to lose. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, Gary. It has been a pleasure having you on. You. I have absolutely enjoyed this conversation. Thank and you. I do hope that you will come back and visit us sometime in the future. Try to keep me away. Oh, that is great. Thank you thank so you. very much. Really appreciate your taking the time to be with thank us. You. And I also want to thank our audience for joining us today. I do hope the information we discussed was relevant and useful to you. If it was, please share it with your family, your friends, and your neighbors. It's been my pleasure to serve as today's host. Please join us for the next edition of Caregivers First. Until then, take care.